Chapter 10 The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson Fulfillment of the Prophecy The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 And among the things which are revealed fulfilled prophecy has a foremost place. In presence of the events in which it has been accomplished, its meaning lies upon the surface. Let the facts of the Passion be admitted, and their relation to the 22nd Psalm is indisputable. There are profound depths of spiritual significance in the psalmist's words, because of the nature of the facts which have fulfilled them, but the testimony which the prophecy affords is addressed to all, and he who runs may read it. Is it possible then, it may be asked, that the true interpretation of this prophecy of the 70 weeks involves so much inquiry and discussion? Such an objection is perfectly legitimate, but the answer to it will be found in distinguishing between the difficulties which appear in the prophecy itself, and those which depend entirely on the controversy to which it has given rise. The writings of Daniel have been more the object of hostile criticism than any other portion of the scripture, and the closing verses of the ninth chapter have always been a principal point of attack. And necessarily so, for if that single passage can be proved to be a prophecy, it establishes the character of the book as a divine revelation. Daniel's visions admittedly described historical events between the days of Nebuchadnezzar and of Antiochus Epiphanes, therefore skepticism assumes that the writer lived in Maccabean times. But this assumption, put forward without even a decent pretense of proof, is utterly refuted by pointing to a portion of the prophecy fulfilled at a later date, and accordingly it is of vital moment to the skeptic to discredit the prediction of the seventy weeks. The prophecy has suffered nothing from the attacks of its assailants, but much at the hands of its friends. No elaborate argument would be necessary to elucidate its meaning, were it not for the difficulties raised by Christian expositors. If everything that Christian writers have written on the subject could be wiped out and forgotten, the fulfillment of the vision, so far as it has been in fact fulfilled, would be clear upon the open page of history. Out of deference to these writers, and also in the hope of removing prejudices which are fatal to the right understanding of the subject, these difficulties have here been discussed. It now remains only to recapitulate the conclusions which have been recorded in the preceding pages. The scepter of earthly power which was entrusted to the house of David, was transferred to the Gentiles in the person of Nebuchadnezzar, to remain in Gentile hands until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The blessings promised to Judah and Jerusalem were postponed till after a period described as 70 weeks, and at the close of the 69th week of this era the Messiah should be cut off. These 70 weeks represent 70 times 7 prophetic years of 360 days, to be reckoned from the issuing of an edict for the rebuilding of the city, the street and rampart, of Jerusalem. The edict in question was the decree issued by Artaxerxes Longitmanus in the 20th year of his reign, authorizing Nehemiah to rebuild the fortifications of Jerusalem. The date of Artaxerxes's reign can be definitely ascertained not from elaborate disquisitions by biblical commentators and prophetic writers, but by the united voice of secular historians and chronologers. The statement of St. Luke is explicit and unequivocal, that our Lord's public ministry began in the fifteenth year of Tiberius Caesar. It is equally clear that it began shortly before the Passover, the date of it can thus be fixed as between August AD 28 and April AD 29. The Passover of the Crucifixion therefore was in AD 32, when Christ was betrayed on the night of the Paschal Supper, and put to death on the day of the Paschal Feast. If then the foregoing conclusions be well founded. We should expect to find that the period intervening between the Edict of Artaxerxes and the Passion was 483 prophetic years. An accuracy as absolute as the nature of the case permits is no more than men are here entitled to demand. There can be no loose reckoning in a divine chronology, and if God has deigned to mark on human calendars the fulfillment of his purposes as foretold in prophecy, the strictest scrutiny shall fail to detect miscalculation or mistake. The Persian edict which restored the autonomy of Judah was issued in the Jewish month of Nisan. It may in fact have been dated the first of Nisan, but, no other day being named, the prophetic period must be reckoned, according to a practice common with the Jews, from the Jewish New Year's Day. 1. The seventy weeks are therefore to be computed from the first of Nisan BC 445. 2. 
Now the great characteristic of the Jewish sacred year has remained unchanged ever since the memorable night when the equinoctial moon beamed down upon the huts of Israel in Egypt, bloodstained by the paschal sacrifice, and there is neither doubt nor difficulty in fixing within narrow limits the Julian date of the first of Nisan in any year whatever. In B.C. 445 the new moon by which the Passover was regulated was on the 13th of March at 7 h. 9 m.a.m. 3, and accordingly the first Nisan may be assigned to the March 14th. But the language of the prophecy is clear, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. An era therefore of sixty-nine weeks, or four hundred and eighty-three prophetic years reckoned from the March 14th, B.C. 445, should close with some event to satisfy the words, unto the Messiah the Prince. The date of the nativity could not possibly have been the termination of the period, for then the sixty-nine weeks must have ended thirty-three years before Messiah's death. If the beginning of his public ministry be fixed upon, difficulties of another kind present themselves. When the Lord began to preach, the kingdom was not presented as a fact accomplished in his advent, but as a hope the realization of which, though at the very door, was still to be fulfilled. He took up the Baptist's testimony, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His ministry was a preparation for the kingdom, leading up to the time when in fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures he should publicly declare himself as the son of David, the king of Israel, and claim the homage of the nation. It was the nation's guilt that the cross and not the throne was the climax of his life on earth. No student of the gospel narrative can fail to see that the Lord's last visit to Jerusalem was not only in fact, but in the purpose of it, the crisis of his ministry, the goal towards which it had been directed. After the first tokens had been given that the nation would reject his messianic claims, he had shunned all public recognition of them. But now the twofold testimony of his words and his works had been fully rendered, and his entry into the holy city was to proclaim his messiahship and to receive his doom. Again and again his apostles even had been charged that they should not make him known. But now he accepted the acclamations of the whole multitude of the disciples, and silenced the remonstrance of the Pharisees with the indignant rebuke, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Luke 19 verses 39 and 40 The full significance of the words which follow in the Gospel of St. Luke is concealed by a slight interpolation in the text. As the shouts broke forth from his disciples, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. He looked off toward the holy city and exclaimed, If thou also hadst known, even on this day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from mine eyes. For, the time of Jerusalem's visitation had come, and she knew it not. Long ere then the nation had rejected him, but this was the predestined day when their choice must be irrevocable, the day so distinctly signalized in Scripture as the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold thy king cometh unto thee! Zechariah 9 verse 9 Of all the days of the ministry of Christ on earth, no other will satisfy so well the angel's words, unto Messiah the Prince. And the date of it can be ascertained. In accordance with the Jewish custom, the Lord went up to Jerusalem upon the eighth Nisan, six days before the Passover. 5. But as the fourteenth, on which the Paschal Supper was eaten, fell that year upon a Thursday, the eighth was the preceding Friday. He must have spent the Sabbath, therefore, at Bethany, and on the evening of the ninth, after the Sabbath had ended, the supper took place in Martha's house. Upon the following day, the tenth Nisan, he entered Jerusalem as recorded in the Gospels. 6. The Julian date of that tenth Nisan was Sunday the April 6, A.D. 32. What then was the length of the period intervening between the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the public advent of Messiah the Prince, between the March 14, B.C. 445, and the April 6, A.D. 32? The interval contained exactly and to the very day 173, 880 days, or seven times 69 prophetic years of 360 days, the first 69 weeks of Gabriel's prophecy. 7. Much there is in holy writ which unbelief may value and revere, while utterly refusing to accept it as divine, but prophecy admits of no half-faith. The prediction of the seventy weeks was either a gross and impious imposture, or else it was in the fullest and strictest sense God breathed. 8. It may be that in days to come, when Judah's great home-bringing shall restore to Jerusalem the rightful owners of its soil, 
the Jews themselves shall yet rake up from deep beneath its ruins the records of the great king's decree and of the Nazarene's rejection, and they for whom the prophecy was given will thus be confronted with proofs of its fulfillment. Meanwhile what judgment shall be passed on it by fair and thoughtful men? To believe that the facts and figures here detailed amount to nothing more than happy coincidences involves a greater exercise of faith than that of the Christian who accepts the book of Daniel as divine. There is a point beyond which unbelief is impossible, and the mind in refusing truth must needs take refuge in a misbelief which is sheer credulity. Chapter 10 Footnotes 1. On the first of Nisan is a new year for the computation of the reign of kings and for festivals. Mishnah, Treatise Rosh Hash. 2. The wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month Elul, in fifty and two days, Nehemiah 6, L5. Now fifty-two days, measured back from the twenty-fifth Elul, brings us to the third about. Therefore Nehemiah must have arrived not later than first of, and apparently some days earlier, Nehemiah 2 verse 11. Compare this with Ezra's journey thirteen years before. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month, Ab, came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him, Ezra 7 verse 9. I infer therefore that Nehemiah also set out early in the first month. The chronological parallelisms between the respective journeys of Ezra and Nehemiah have suggested the ingenious theory that both went up to Jerusalem together, Ezra 7 and Nehemiah 2 relating to the same event. This is based upon the supposition that the regnal years of Artaxerxes, according to Persian computation, were reckoned from his birth, a supposition, however, which is fanciful and arbitrary, though described by its author as, by no means unlikely, Transactions S.O.C. de Barch, 2, 110, Rev. D.E.H. Hay, February 4, 1873. 3. For this calculation I am indebted to the courtesy of the Astronomer Royal, whose reply to my inquiry on the subject is appended. Royal Observatory, Greenwich. June 26, I-877. SIR, I have had the moon's place calculated from large dose tables in additions to the Canaisens de Thames 1846, by one of my assistants, and have no doubt of its correctness. The place being calculated for 444, March 12d. 20h, French reckoning, or March 12d. 8h, p.m., it appears that the said time was short of new moon by about 8h. 47m, and therefore the new moon occurred at 4h. 47 m a m march 13th paris time i am etc signed g b e r y the new moon therefore occurred at jerusalem on the march 13th bc 445 444 astronomical at 7 h 9 m a m for e i agnos kai su kai ji in taham era ta prosai so k t luke 19 verse 42 the received text inserts so after Hamera, but the best manuscripts, Alex. That sin, etc., agree in omitting it. Kaiso, thou also, as well as these my disciples, Kai Giudi Kadem, even, Alfred, Giartest in loco. The revised version reads, If thou hadst known in this day, etc. 5. When the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day of the month Xanthicus, i.e., Nisan, Josephus, Wars, 6. 5, 3. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem, before the Passover, to purify themselves, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, John 11 verse 55, 12 colon 1. 6, Lewin, Fasti Sacri, page 230. 7, the first Nisan in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes, the edict to rebuild Jerusalem, was March 14, B.C. 445. The tenth Nissan in Passion Week, Christ's entry into Jerusalem, was 6th. April, A.D. 32. The intervening period was 476 years and 24 days, the days being reckoned inclusively, as required by the language of the prophecy, and in accordance with the Jewish practice. But 476 times 365 is equal to 173, 740 days add, March 14th to April 6th, both inclusive. 24 days add for leap years 116 days equals a total of 173,880 days. And 69 weeks of prophetic years of 360 days, or 69 by 7 by 360, 173, 880 days.
it may be well to offer here two explanatory remarks. First, in reckoning years from B.C. to A.D., one year must always be omitted, for it is obvious, XGR, that from B.C. 1 to A.D. I was not two years, but one year. B to C1 ought to be described as being C0, and it is so reckoned by astronomers, who would describe the historical date BC 445 as 444. And secondly, the Julian year is 11 M. 1040 Axis, or about the 129th part of a day, longer than the mean solar year. The Julian calendar, therefore, contains three leap years too many in four centuries, an error which had amounted to 11 days in AD 17527 when our English calendar was corrected by declaring the September 3rd to be the September 14th, and by introducing the Gregorian reform which reckons three secular years out of four as common years, XGR, 1700, 1800 and 1900 are common years, and 2000 is a leap year. Old Christmas Day is still marked in our calendars, and observed in some localities, on the January 6th, and to this day the calendar remains uncorrected in Russia. See Appendix 4, page 306 Note 8. 8. Theopneustos, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16.